webcast of Governance Dialogues curated by Governance Center. Governance Dialogues, a program that I'm hosting on a weekly basis, offers insight into economic and corporate governance challenges presented in informal yet hard-hitting setting for, with uh, thought leaders. My name is Lisa Cole and I'm the Managing Director of Governance Center. And through these dialogues, we're engaging with you, our global audience, at a time when the interest in governance, I believe, is peaking worldwide. But the understanding of how it can assist organizations and governments overcome what we're trespassing right now, which is an existential crisis, as well as operational challenging for corporations is, I believe, the missing link. And we think that the current economic context characterized by major economic contraction and the social context where the trust in governments and also corporations um, is at all times low since actually the financial crisis of 2008 offers a unique context for talking about governance. What is it really? And what purpose does it serve? How can it really be deployed for the benefit of corporations and ultimately the societies we're living in? And as the current pandemic unfolds, the reckoning facing corporate boards and executives will be more evident. And our prediction is, is, is that as the virus is reshaping the corporate sphere, the very concept of what governance is will no longer be the same in 2021. And this conclusion gave us the impetus to launch this program to give you, our global audience, an insider view into the operation of uh, policymakers, but also corporate boards that we're exploring through the series of episodes called Govern Dialogues. And today, it gives me immense pleasure to host David Beatty, um, Canada's foremost uh, corporate governance uh, expert, who among his multiple roles is also a senior advisor at Govern. Uh, David is uh, leading the work of uh, Canada's um, uh, University of Toronto's Corporate Governance Center. He is perhaps the most solicited uh, corporate governance expert in Canada, but also internationally. Um, he is the founder um, and um, director, was a director of the Canadian Co Coalition of Corporate Governance with, uh, 50, um, with 50 institutional investors. Uh, putting in $1.3 trillion of uh, Canadian dollars of assets under management. Um, David has been recognized in, for his work um, internationally, um, no notably by the International Corporate Governance Network most recently. He's been inducted into the Order of Canada, Canada's uh, highest um, civilian order, and has been awarded uh, by Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth um, II for his remarkable work. David, welcome uh, to Governance Dialogues. It is a pleasure to have you join us today. Thank you, Lisa. It's, it's a, always a pleasure to have a chat with you. I always come away a lot wiser than I was when I entered. Thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure to work with you. I've had the um, tremendous honor to work with you from Canada to Saudi Arabia, share podiums uh, in various capitals and, and talk about governance. And I'm always humbled by your ability to straddle um, this very difficult line between um, academic world, which sometimes seems tends to be quite rigid in its conceptions of governance and, and in your ability to pierce through um, um, corporate boardrooms, which is natural. You've worked, um, you've sat on boards of 40 uh, companies, I believe, from Canada to the US to Mexico and many other countries. And you've chaired, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, about nine companies um, in the past. So it is natural, of course, that you have uh, immense expertise um, in this in this sphere, and what I would like to do over the next 15 or 20 minutes, um, if you if you allow us, is to shine a flashlight exactly in your sphere uh, of expertise, and and sort of ask you a few pointed questions around the word of the the role of boards in governance today, and in the role of, of boards in in navigating the current crisis uh, we're facing. So I thought the first question that I would like to ask you is is specifically on the roles of, of boards in the current pandemic. And I noticed that in your uh, recent uh, comments in engaging, um, you, you've been noting, especially the boards of a number of companies. You mentioned uh, Mars, you mentioned uh, Marriott and Microsoft. And I don't want to, to, uh, to say that there's a common denominator between uh, the letter M and good governance, but it seems to me that you're suggesting that these companies have something in terms of their governance that perhaps other boards have not been able to, to foster or to, um, to use to their advantage. And I wonder if you could say a few words around where you see the, these leading practices uh, coming from. Well, I think they emanate from a fundamental decision that most boards of directors don't make. And that is what is the time frame 
uh, under which we are seeking to carry out our strategy as a company. Um, if the number is short, you get attacked by short-termism, you get attacked by activism, and you're running the company quarter to quarter to quarter, which probably means in the medium to long term, uh, you're not able to give the total return to shareholders from your reinvestment in your business than you ought to. Never forget that the greatest investor of our age, Warren Buffett, didn't even give dividends. He said, I know what to do with my money better than you do, and I'll do better for you if you stay with me. So I'm not giving you a dividend, let alone a share buyback. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Where I came out with the pandemic was it was an opportunity when the market tanks for companies who had a lot of resilience on their balance sheet to pounce on the best assets, the best businesses, the best people, because so many publicly traded companies went so deeply into debt in order to buy back shares to increase the dividends that they're on their knees now with the bankers begging for better terms. Where they should be is in other companies picking out the choice assets of those troubled corporations. So I came out of the pandemic first thinking, this is a real opportunity for boards of directors to think in cyclical terms and to try to define in what time frame they want their management team and them as a board to be thinking about running the company. We know the world is cyclical. We know it goes up, it goes down. We just never know what's going to cause the next one. So this one was a pandemic. The last one was a global financial crisis. The one before that was 9-11. The one before that was an overwrought market that absolutely exploded in dot-com startups. I mean, you never know where the next uh, crisis is going to come from, but you do know there will be another one. And markets go up and then they come down. And what you want to do in my view, in the up period is store your resources. Husband, the scarcest thing that you're going to need when things go down again, as they will, and that is your cash and your balance sheet resilience. So I came away thinking there's a real chance for boards to have a fundamental look at what is the time frame under which we are developing the strategy for our corporation. Hmm. That is very interesting. And in fact, the short termism is a, is a word that was used widely in the analysis, as you know, of the last financial crisis. And there were a number of um, regulatory measures that were adopted to rein in short termism, notably in executive remuneration, but also in disclosure with the uh, UK uh, securities regulator, for example, suggesting scrapping away quarterly reporting. And yet here, about 10 years later, uh, we're at the same point. Do you have thoughts as to you know, how the short-term tendencies might be overcome and what boards of leading companies that are not looking quarter to quarter are doing differently in, in, in addressing this pressure from investors and shareholders and, and, um, and others? Well, the intensity of short-termism to me was captured by the formation of Capital for the Long Term, CFLT, a nonprofit institution established by Dominic Barton when he was worldwide head of McKinsey, and Mark Wiseman, who was the worldwide head of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, which has got 450 billion or something like that under management. And those two said, these pressures are so real, we are going to find a way to build a countervailing force, and that's what's there. The people who manage that are really extraordinary and their board of advisors is extraordinary. So it's a hugely potentially powerful force. What is discouraging though, is they did a survey asking C-suite executives and directors in a company that wasn't a dot-com type of digital corporation, what is the time frame under which you should be considering strategy? And there's a lot of humming and hoeing and a lot of different points of view. But essentially, the answer came back three to five years would be the time frame under which I would like to be considering the strategy for this corporation. And then they asked the question, OK, if that's what it ought to be, what is your experience today of what it is? And the answer was less than two years. And then they asked the question, are these pressures increasing a lot over the last three to five years? And 86 percent of the respondents said yes. And their last query was, would we all be better off if we had a longer time frame into which we were trying to push our corporate strategy thinking? And the answer was 93% said yes. So short termism in American publicly traded companies is still a colossal force. 
and it's being exacerbated by activism. Last year in the US, I think there was something in the order of 550 activist campaigns against publicly traded companies that went public. And they say that for everyone that goes public, there's two that are settled behind closed doors. So that's like 1,500 companies were attacked last year out of a total population of maybe 4,500. Hmm. I mean, that's amazing. So these are huge, huge costs for corporations. And um, I reckon that it could cost up to 20% of management's time trying to cope with these external forces. What is being done to counter them besides the good work, the beacon on the hill of the focus capital on long term? Practically speaking, people are staying private. The number of publicly traded firms in the United States has dropped by 50% in the last 20 years. Five, oh, 50%, half as many companies. That's non-trivial, it's not just a rounding error. It's an enormous sea change. And there were 110 public companies last year, 110 IPOs in uh, 2019. And of them, 35 were high tech companies and of the 35, 80% of them came with dual class shares. So the answer, in terms of capitalism and how it works is to get away from these costs and these pressures by creating a share voting structure that goes back to the 17th, 18th century, which was very common back then, and insulate yourselves from these, what are believed to be destructive forces by not having the same number of shares attached to the equity participant as you would one-to-one. -one. It's 10 to one, it's 100 to one. In the case of Snap, created a furor because they came public with shares that had no votes. And that did create a bit of a firestorm. But that's been the answer because these two pressures of activism and short-termism are not going away. At the same time as any company wanting to start up can find an infinite amount of support in the private equity market. So you don't need, you don't, you don't need that equity markets anymore to finance yourself. And you're no longer building railways, canals, bridges, hotels you're building intellectual property, which doesn't require much capital. So we're sort of in an age of innovation where not much capital is required. That amount of capital that is required is being found outside of public markets. And those that decide in the end to go to public markets are going with different forms. So a fundamental transformation That's of uh, pu public markets, yeah. That's fascinating. And in fact, um, some of the, the comments you've been making are, we are also echoing in our research um, and it's not uh, only private companies um, that are protecting themselves uh, through, uh, through double uh, dual voting class shares. And I think that one of the new tidal waves, and we've been writing about that, uh, of course, in the current crisis will be also poison pills and, and other mechanisms that even um, perhaps government companies and governments in Europe um, are, are introducing investment mm -hmm. restrictions. Um, potentially, we, we've been writing about this as well, um, uh, golden shares might come back in fashion. So these um, mechanisms of protection and control um, might become more prevalent in a variety of companies, both uh, publicly listed and, and, perhaps, um, and, and perhaps others. Um, but, but coming back to this point of short-termism, I think that there are, there's a dichotomy. On one hand, we certainly don't want uh, the corporate world to be quarter to quarter. On the other hand, there are um, in immediate, let's say, danger um, a short term is danger for companies from takeovers to continuity to whatnot. And, and um, there was an interesting piece, I'm not sure if you've seen by McKinsey, that talks about uh, what they termed nerve centers. So companies establishing nerve centers, uh, meaning um, um, different governance structures composed of board members, executives to basically wither this crisis, to deal with uh, employee concerns, to deal with safety concerns, to deal with um, supply chain disruptions and whatnot. Um, and as a former board member and, and chairman of, 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 of a number of companies, what would be your reflexes or some of your first reflexes uh, for the benefit of our audience in dealing with, with this type of crisis? What kind of a nerve center would you establish if you were today running a publicly listed company? Well, I would continue to use my board. I just increase the frequency of our interactions by an order of magnitude. Um, the virtual meetings, I have them, I'm chairman of two startup corporations, they're not publicly traded, but we meet um, every Friday just to catch up on, on a Zoom call. And um, I'm in touch with the CEOs, I'd say twice a day. And it's simply to keep pace with what is happening 
intended, unintended, surprise, planned uh, with the corporation. So I think there's an intensity of contact because nothing is the same and going forward, nothing will be the same. So what are we learning? What are we adapting to? And I looked for a continuity of a dialogue between the management team and the, and the board of directors. Hmm. That's interesting. And, and one of the things that you mentioned and also from your experience in, um, in the past and currently, um, the differences in, in, in governance models, which are evident from US to Canada to Europe, do you think that there are, there are different modus operandi that we're seeing uh, unravel now as a result of the crisis in terms of how companies are reacting in terms of, for example, dealing with their employees, which is a huge concern currently, um, and, and how governance yeah. is different from continent to continent, finally. Yeah, I think companies who were over-leveraged, doing share buybacks for their shareholders, and increasing dividends, and going to the bank to borrow the money to do it, are now in a situation where they have to drive the thing for cash and there's no other value. Well, if you value your employees, if you think they are a differentiating characteristic, and I for one B believe that the only long-term strategic way of differentiating yourself is with the people you have retain and motivate and who end up loving the company and the experience, this is your time to reach out to them. Um, we have a privately based company here in Canada called Geotab, which is the world's largest uh, vehicle transponder corporation. So for example, the state of California knew the vehicles it owned, it's just when the fires broke out, they didn't know where they were. Um, they do all of the, all of the UPS, uh, FedEx, uh, US Postal Service stuff. They mm -hmm. track every truck every moment of every day. And they've kept the balance sheet intact and they've grown the surplus from retained earnings. And they're saying now, so many of our competitors and so many people in adjacent fields are so desperate for cash that we have literally put out a, a common work for Geotab ad in all kinds of magazines because we know we have the strength, the balance sheet resilience to be able to attract today the very best players in the world in this, in this universe because a lot of them are going to be working for troubled companies who will put them on half pay or put them on furlough or something else. Come and work for me. I can pay you. I want you. Live wherever you want. It's a huge advantage. And if you take a hotel chain, um, Marriott, the largest hotel company in the world, has got a hugely beverage balance sheet. So they're on their knees to the bankers. That's what they do in the C-suite. They beg bankers for more resilience. Four Seasons Hotels um, has always, in a crisis like this, used it as a signal opportunity to tell their employees how important they are to the delivery of consistent luxury service. So they work with everybody openly all the time. Maybe we should close one floor. Maybe, Alicia, you'd like to go back and visit your mother in Bulgaria. Take a leave of absence for a month. And every day in 9-11, Izzy Sharp would be on the phone for an hour with every one of his hotel managers saying, what ideas have you got that will demonstrate to our people that they are our strategically differentiating asset and yet at the same time, not put us under because of a cash flow problem. Mm -hmm. And they found all kinds of mechanisms to do it and came out of that with an employee workforce that was so dedicated to them that I think they're untouchable even today. And they're doing exactly the same thing today in the marketplace. So having the balance sheet resilience in a time of crisis gives you a huge strategic opportunity to improve your players, your assets, your, your playing fields, that nobody else who's levered themselves looking after the short term needs of shareholders is gonna have. That's why I wanna go back and think about what's the time frame on which we're managing this company and strategizing for this company. Because mm -hmm. if it's a secular time frame you're going to say the next crisis, Elisa, the next crisis, our company is going to go ahead by a factor of 10 because we are going to manage and look after our resources against that date, which we don't know, but it'll come. Interesting. So, yeah. I, I, um, I always um, uh, admire and, and love the examples that you're able to give. Unfortunately, my mother is not in Bulgaria, but the examples are, are very interesting. <laughs> Um, from hotel chains to, to other companies and how they're, they're weathering the current storm. And sort of in the interest of time, because I, I promised that these uh, conversations uh, would be executive style and not 
uh, terribly long. I would like to ask you one, sort of one last question um, and sort of um, see if we can enlighten our audience on, 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 on a more big picture question on, on governance. In the words of uh, Nicholas Taleb, do you think this is a sort of a big a black swan event, um, not a big a black swan event for governance? Would, would in the next iteration of governance 2.0 or 3.0, past this crisis, would it be more of the same adjustments in the size of board of directors, a new uh, committee of the board being brought in, or do you think it, it will fundamentally make regulators rethink um, the very conception of board of directors, management interruptions, reporting lines in, in, a, in a big picture way? Uh, no, I think this is part of a continuing crisis that started, the first example I know is the collapse of the South Seas Corporation in 1720 when a big bubble blew up on the London Stock Exchange and that company went to the earth. Writing 50 years later, Adam Smith said, people looking after money other than their own are unlikely to do so with the same anxious vigilance with which they look over their own assets. So we've had this problem of directors who drop in, spend 8% of the time of the management team, probably are good experienced executives but know nothing about the particular business, and are hugely active doing a hundred other things, trying to operate in a field of uncertain knowledge, often in, a, in an arena where the CEO is trying to dominate them because directors generally eat what they're fed. And this problem's been with us for 400 years. Now we keep reliving it in different forms. So 15 banks wrote off $2 trillion worth of shareholder value in 20178. Where was their board of directors? Each of those boards were 15 people. Each of those individual 15 people had a resume. You'd die to meet somebody with it. And yet collectively, they wrote off $2 trillion. How well did the board of directors of a widely held company work in that case? And to go back to the previous generation, how about Ahold, Parmalat, uh, Health South, um, that little company called Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia. I mean, it just, these are continuing crisis of the structure we've inherited uh, for 500 years and we're just kind of continue to learn to live with them. We do improve. We put Sarbanes-Oxley in after the WorldCom, HealthCom, Adelphia scandals. And that had the really interesting idea that it would be a good idea to have somebody chairing the audit committee who knew what an audit was. Nice. And if there's, a, if there's a criminal act in here that somebody's fraudulently misrepresented the truth, we're gonna charge criminally the CEO and the CFO. So pay attention. That reform was good. We had Dodd-Frank in the financial arena who said to financial institutions, just as the way we thought it would be good to have somebody in the um, audit committee who knew what an audit was, we think it's a good idea for you financial institutions uh, to have somebody who knows something about risk in financial institutions. So risk committees got formed. So I think there's a specificity to the industry sector you're in, but generically the problem of boards not working well is one that's been with us forever. And I don't think it's ever going away. Now maybe one of the, one of the things I have seen in the digital tsunami where we were all worried about, my God, all of our businesses are gonna be changed fundamentally overnight by digitization. Boards started bringing on younger directors. In the United States, the average age of a director is 65. Walmart now has three directors in their 40s because they perceived Amazon to be their long-term competitor and said, we have to change the governance structure of skill sets on the board in order to represent more of that long-term strategic threat. So it was both a function of having a vision that was a cycle away and then reacting in terms of skill sets on the boards. But I think those are improvements kind of business by business, industry by industry to try and improve something that's basically terribly imperfect. Mm. Well, we, we live in a terribly imperfect world, but and I think your comments are at once uh, comforting and, and of concern in terms of the continuity <laughs> problems that we will be seeing. Um, and I, I, I mean, certainly stick on your, your views on that. But um, again, in the interest of time, I, I would like to thank you very much for joining uh, Governance Dialogues today and for sharing your insights on specific um, company cases, but also on the trend line, on the governance trend line, so to speak, um, in, in the context of, of these um, episodes. We hope um, you found these, uh, this Governance Dialogue as uh, fascinating as I have in conversation with uh, David Beatty. And I hope um, we'll have an occasion to host him in, in future occasions. 
this um, particular episode will be available um, gratis on the website of Govern Center at um, govern.center and also on our dedicated YouTube uh, channel. And please feel free to share, engage uh, and comment. Uh, we will be available to respond to your questions um, and look forward to uh, having you join future um, episodes of Governance Dialogue. I will not reveal for the moment who our uh, next uh, guest will be, but suffice it to say, it will be a chairman of a major family office in the Gulf, who's uh, actually been at the helm withering the storm and guiding his company through, um, through this crisis um, as his family has for a couple of hundred years now. So um, that said, thank you very much, David. Um, really appreciate your insights and uh, look forward to having you on future occasions. Join us at Governance Dialogues. Thank you, Elisa. My pleasure, as always. Mm -hmm.